Hi, Pi Texas. Thanks for attending my virtual talk on gathering insights from audio data. I'm Ryan Bales. Let's dig in. So I work at a company in Chicago uh, called Dialogue Tech. I'm our director of data science and analytics. Uh, the goal of my team is to, so we work in the marketing technology space. So my team is responsible for taking phone calls from our customers and converting them into text and the transcriptions. And then from there, uh, we have lots of different models and other processes to convert them into different insights and uh, outputs that we deliver to our customers. Um, in addition, I also work in the Python and data engineering space here in Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm based. So the goal of this talk is to discuss audio data at different levels. We're going to talk about um, audio data as raw sense. We're going to talk about tools to look at audio data and explore it. We're going to uh, talk about how we gather features, train models, and then we'll go to text and talk about ways we can work with it there. So the first thing we'll talk about is um, how do we hear sound as humans? So uh, this is a picture of uh, your ear, uh, of a human ear. And what we're seeing here is that to hear things, um, different um, pressures, difference in pressure is picked up and passed into your ear canal from your outer ear, travels down the ear canal into the, um, on the far um, right of your screen, the cochlea, and uh, once it travels to the cochlea, there's a lot of different hair follicles there that ride along the uh, what's called the, the basilar membrane. As those hair follicles vibrate up against the membrane, um, that creates electricity, small electrical pulses. And those are then car carried by your auditory nerve up to your brain, and that's how we hear things. And similarly, how a computer hears things, um, the analog sound is, uh, signal is up top. And then when the computer does its digital to analog conversion, it's converting those that sound to ones and zeros uh, down below. When the sound uh, analog is high, the um, wave is high, it comes as a one. And then when it drops down um, low, it gives us a zero over time. So basic characteristics here, we'll talk about a wave. We'll talk about the um, amplitude is the size or displacement of the vibration. And it typically determines how, how loud the sound is. I think about it this way. When you, when you want to uh, make the sound louder, you're, you're amplifying or you're increasing the sound of the wave. Uh, and then separately, frequency is the speed of the wave. Um, and that controls the, the pitch of the, of the sound you're hearing. So one of the characteristics we want to think about when talking about digital data is um, sampling rate. And... Two different things we want to talk about with this when we're sampling. We want to talk about the sampling rate and the bit depth. So what you see here is just a basic chart um, of an analog signal, and then each of the red lines is a, a sample that we're taking. So the, the what can lead to higher quality audio is how fast you're sampling. For example, a typical phone call is sampling at 8 kilohertz, whereas um, a higher quality um, audio recording is at 44.1K. Uh, hertz, and then it goes on and on and up from there for you know high high quality movies and and other digital um, theater type work is 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 much higher. But the 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 larger that number, the more often you're taking a sample, and the more often you sample the wave, the better representation you'll have of that wave digitally. Additionally, the bit depth is the is the number of bits being sampled uh, for each sample. Typically, you're going to see bit depths um, at eight. 16 or 24 bytes, you know, uh, one, two or three bytes. Um, that's just simply controlling the amount of data you take uh, per, per each sample. So the, you want to have a high sampling rate and a, and a high bit depth. That's going to give you the better representation of the, of the analog audio when it comes to digital, when you sample it. So let's also briefly talk about wave file formats or audio file formats, excuse me. So um, common audio file formats are waved, uncompressed, FLAC, lossless compressed, and MP3, lossy compressed. So um, typically a dialect that we try to work with way, we try to re record things in, in near CD quality um, audio, but we, we have been considering converting them to FLAC. So FLAC will get you about 30 to 40% smaller files, and it does so with the compression algorithm that is built, prop, uh, it was, it's built with audio data in mind, so it knows how to compress audio very well. Um, and you will not lose um, quality of the audio. Alternatively, MP3s give you 75 plus um, smaller samples, uh, smaller file sizes, but you're going to have some loss in the process. So it, it's, it really is gonna depend on your application as to how you're gonna work with that. If you're working with audio with multiple speakers, um, you wanna do your best to keep a speaker per channel. 
So when you talk about mono audio, that is audio where every single um, audio channel, every, every person, every feed of audio into that file is mixed down into one channel or mono or mono single channel. Um, what I'm showing you on the screen here is a typical phone call um, or conversation where you have dual channels. So you have speaker A and you have speaker, speaker one, speaker two, and, and you're seeing their different uh, pieces of audio as time progresses. Um, that's, a, that's a dual channel or sometimes called stereo audio. And similarly, think about it with, um, you know, some, some of you may have a home theater at home and you have a 5.1 Dolby surround. That literally has six channels of audio being processed for each each um, each sound is trying, trying to display, uh, trying to produce. So it's, it has your center left and right channels up front, and then it has your left rear and right rear. And if you have that point one, you typically have a, a subwoofer trying to give you amplified sound to, for those for those deep sounds. So let's change gears a minute and talk about some tools. So the first tool I really like is is Sox. Straight out of the box, um, you can man Sox inside of Linux. Uh, it's it's cross platform. You can install it on uh, Macs or Windows. Uh, it's really just a, a Swiss Army knife, you know, jack of all trades tool. Um, typically, I'll drop in here Sox dash dash I for a WAV file. If I get a piece of audio, I want to quickly know what's going on with it. I just hop in here. Um, from here, I can tell you this audio file has one channel. It's recorded at forty four point one k bit depth of six bit depth of sixteen, um, etc. You can also tell it's about three minutes and thirty two seconds. Um, actually, sorry, three point three about three and a third seconds of in length. Um, so in, in Sox, you can do tons more than dash dash I. If you can go to the man page on it or Google it, there's there's hundreds of commands you can do with Sox. But it's a, it's a, super, a super easy to work with tool that gets the ball rolling when you're trying to start with some audio files. And then if you like UI is better, um, I really enjoyed Audacity. It's one of the first things I install when I set up a new, a new system. Uh, I typically will grab a hold of Udacity, install it, and um, I love to just grab an audio file, open up Udacity, take a look at the at the WAV files. Um, you could even you know convert these things to to different different characteristics of the file. You can use Audacity to record. Um, you can skip ahead. There's a there's a lot of great things you can do with Audacity. Also cross platform. So next up, we're going to talk about um, different types of audio features and how you can how you can generate them. And we'll show some code in a minute here. So first, we'll talk about raw audio data. Um, right here, we're working with a, a amplitude measurements taken at every sample. So in this example, we have a five-second wave. You can see the one through five on the bottom of the time scale. Um, and the sampling here is at 44.1K. So um, on this entire file, uh, in, to produce this graph, we opened up and processed 221,000 elements to produce this data. And it's as simply as opening up the file and, and showing the data. Separately, um, we can then convert that raw audio data into a spectrogram. So a spectrogram, um, the next few things we're going to look at here are very much just uh, mathematical ways of shaping and converting this information. And you're going to see a lot of use of, of uh, Fourier's transform. So in this case, uh, a spectrogram is created by taking digital data and breaking it up into overlapped windows across time. And then over each window, you're going to do a Fourier transform to calculate the magnitude and frequency and you're going to you know, keep repeating over each window of data. So in this case, you're going to take um, the time is across the x-axis, the frequency is on the y-axis, and the amplitude is displayed as that heat map there, that zero dBs up to negative 80 dBs. Uh, and the this is this is sometimes called a MEL spectrogram uh, because it's based on the MEL uh, frequencies. And the name MEL, as we all could probably guess, comes from the word melody which in the case, the scale is based on for its pitch comparisons. And then another way of uh, visualizing and working with audio features is a, is a chromogram, also known as chroma features. And uh, this is based on comparison between the 12 different pitch classes, you know, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, et cetera. So like a spectrogram, in a chromogram, we are taking uh, the audio, we're windowing over it, we're doing what's called a short time Fourier transform, and then we're comparing those results against each pitch class. And if you look at this chart, um, top to uh, bottom to top here, you're you're going to if you look closely enough at it, you would see twelve different blocks um, uh, vertically. Uh, that's every single pitch class, top to bottom. And then the color of that is the difference between the pitch class and how how well it lines up with that absolute pitch class. 
And the next one, probably the hardest to visualize is, um, and even a mouthful to say, is a, a male frequency sepstral coefficient. Um, those are made up of MFC, MFCs, um, and it's really a result of using inverse Fourier transforms of the signal. So there's a lot of steps in math to this. Um, just at a high level, kind of similar to the spectrogram, you're going to break up everything up into smaller chunks and, and window over the data. And then you're going to do a Fourier transform of each of those windows. And then you're going to take the resulting spectrum into the metal frequency scale. Then you're going to take a log of powers of that frequency. And finally, you're going to do a discrete cosine transform to your MEL uh, scale log powers. And at the end, you're left with MFCCs. Um, this is actually the, the type of uh, it's a type of uh, feature that's typically used inside of um, different speech to text um, conversion systems that are they're trying to transcribe audio. Okay, let's look at a little bit of that code. So I'm going to give all my demos here and examples inside of Jupyter, uh, Jupyter notebooks. So I'm not going to go through everything line by line. Uh, at the end, I'll put up a slide that'll have all of the information. Um, and uh, and how you can get a hold of the data, but I'm using a uh, in the in the code. Uh, I'm using a, a package here called Labrosa. Uh, big fan of Labrosa. We're bringing in Matplotlib for visualizations, and um, I'm going to go down here a little bit quickly. We're going to go to the raw audio line here. So this line four that you see on the screen, this is um, Labrosa that load and is passing in my audio file. And I wanted to show this because it's important that you pass in none for your sample rate because you don't want. You can use a sample rate if you want to up or down sample. Um, I'm doing no sample. I'm doing no uh, sample conversion here. I, I'm not up sampling or down sampling. I just want to grab it raw. So out comes the raw audio, and out comes my sample rate of 44.1 into my two output parameters. Then I can simply just call labrosa.display, passing that data, and visualize it. And then likewise, I can do the same thing for the MEL spectrogram, uh, passing in the audio sample rate. And to draw the plot, uh, to calculate the spectrogram, you have to tell it the um, size, the number of 4-H you want to do, um, your windows effectively, and then your hop links, how far you want to move through the file as you're, as you're processing through it. And then from here, you're going to get out the uh, spectrogram, and you're going to uh, convert those from powers to decibels, and then you plot. And then down here, we see the output below. And then you do the same thing for chromograms and MFCCs that uh, when you grab a little bit, you can take a closer look at and, and look at more closely. But that's the, that's the basic overview. Labrosa is a really super powerful tool to work with. Cool. So to go forward, we're going to take a look at a um, audio classification example. So I downloaded a sample from uh, Freesound. I got it through Kaggle. Uh, and I downloaded There's There's 41 sample classes, uh, over 9,000 examples. We're going to walk through this data. We're going to split it into train and test sets. And we're going to train a model on this information and see how that goes. So we'll go to our next notebook. And again, we're not going to go through the whole uh, notebook here in depth. But uh, from here, we're loading our training data set. And we can see that we have the file name, the label, hi-hats, saxophones, um, uh, cellos, et cetera. And we also have this manually verified column. That's going to come in, in, in handy in a second. So there's just over 9,000 examples, 9,473. There's 41 categories. You can see a list of them here below. And then what I chose to do for when I was building this is I wanted to look at the manually verified, uh, how it kind of broke down. So for acoustic guitar, we have almost 200 that were not verified and 100 that were verified. And then further, I went down and I plotted that. So I stacked, I did a stacked bar. And then if we look here, the um, orange is where we have verified that information manually and, and zero blue is where we haven't. So looking at different examples here, gongs and flutes. We've done uh, not a lot of verification, but saxophone and violin or fiddle has, have done a lot of validation. So further, I, take a, I took a look at and said, let's just work with our manually verified data. Um, and then looking at that, we have 3,700 manually verif verified options. So um, this notebook is in here. If you grab the data and you want to work with it, this will help you to um, process the CSV and, and split everything out into separate folders by type. Um, I'm not going to go through this directly, but this is um, this is simply uh, taking our data set. We're splitting it 80-20 into test and train sets. And then from here, we're outputting our um, results into CSVs. Um, these CSVs are really important for our next couple of notebooks. 
And then further, the audio files, we're moving them around um, on disk to get everything ready. So the cell book is really helpful for munging your data around and, and, and getting it set up for your modeling. But the big thing is to take, a, take away from this is that we're taking this these three 3,700 examples and we're splitting them 80-20. So then further here in this third notebook, we're going to build a model using the MSCC features. And again, you're going to see a lot of stuff you've seen in, in previous notebooks. We have uh, Labrosa coming in, we're loading up uh, NumPy, and we're also bringing in Pandas and, uh, and Keras. So we're bringing in Keras to do our modeling with, and we'll get there in a second. So again, we have all of our feature extraction code. Everything is up here. You've seen this code before, showing all the visualizations. We're going to, we're going to skip past this, um, and we're going to come down here below. Um, this code is the get MSCC's function. And I just want to make a note that um, this function actually has padding built into it. So what I do here is I actually pad the file out with zeros if it's not long enough. And if it is long, if it's too long, I just truncate it at the max length of 128 uh, windows. That was so uh, when training a model, of course, you want to have um, similar length, uh, same length data going in. Um, so we're just we're just chopping off some files and we're rounding things out to, to pad things. Then we're looping over all the files on our on disk, and we're building up our um, our features. And then from our features, we're generating our um, we're taking all of those. So we have all of those words, all of the um, categories that are that are text at this point. This two categorical is just converting those into a Y features list. Just it's a it's a by, it's a one hot of all of the different features that we have in the, in the data. And then the first thing I do, and I highly recommend this before I start training, uh, is I, start, I save everything off to this file. that have features.numpy, label, label encoder. If, if this notebook crashes, if my kernel goes away, if something dies, I can come back and restart everything. So that's super helpful. It's a really helpful step to do before you get rolling. You don't want to, you, know, you get so far in, you don't want to go through and refit, re regenerate your data and everything. You want to be able to just, you know, come back to the cell, load your data and, and keep going with your training. So the next cell, cell here is my model, and, and it's all here in this one uh, cell. This is all I needed to do. So I'm using a sequential model uh, from Keras. I'm just adding a batch normalization layer, just trying to normalize the data coming in so that's, that the um, types of data is balanced amongst those features, uh, amongst those different categories. And then I have, I have two LSTM layers where I'm, I'm uh, starting off at 128 units because that's, that's, my, that's my size of my uh, my my width that I'm, I'm, I'm truncating my files at, 128 windows. And then I'm, I'm coming down to 32 windows. Um, and then from there, I'm going to a dense layer where the, the size of my dense layer is all the classes and I'm doing an activation um, of softmax. So I'm, I'm predicting the probability of that audio file um, 41 times. I'm telling it 41 different uh, probabilities. And then I'm also using, um, I'm using dropout here um, 0.05 on my dropout setting. I'm using that to, so dropout when I'm training this model is just telling it the model when I'm training it just to randomly effectively turn off different nodes. So I try to avoid overfitting to different categories, different types of, of, uh, of files. So um, I trained on a MacBook Pro. I was able to do 50 epochs, um, uh, batch size of 16. And you can see how everything started off here. It started off with the, you know, um, Fairly high amount of loss that trained out as we went, and you can see my accuracy getting a little bit better, 0 0.58, 0 0.6, etc. Um, another helpful, and helpful part of Keras is model summary. You can see once your model's trained, how it turned out, and it's absolutely like I expected: batch normalization, two LSTMs, and a dense layer. And then before you start doing anything else, save it to disk. Um, Keras comes with um, H5 support, H5Pi. So model.save to an H5 file, and you're done. That way you have your, your saved model. Again, if your notebook crashes, you didn't lose anything. So let's see how we're doing. You know, we, we, we're, it's telling us here we got a, about a 0.6 on the uh, 0.75 on the accuracy. Let's see how well we're holding up uh, against our validation set. So I'm going to load in one, one file, uh, my validation set. And I'm, you know, I'm showing you the first five. I'm, oh, actually I skipped here. So. Um, I, I'm loading up this one file, this bass drum, this uh, this this WAV file, and I'm I'm converting it to MSCCs um, with my get MSCCs function, and then I'm calling model.predict. And my prediction is this. And as you expected, there are 41 different probabilities here, 41 different floats. And then all I'm doing is numpy argmax, and I'm indexing into my classes uh, list with that. And then from there, I get the bass drum back. So it worked. 
So for one example, held up just fine. So now if I look at my entire validation set and I loop over these five and process them, uh, well, I process the whole validation set and I look at these first five, like, yeah, not too bad. This is good. This is good. We missed it on the telephone. Um, we got three out of five. Three out of five is pretty good. So what we want to do next is we want to take a look at how well the model is performing. So uh, inside of uh, the notebook here, I'm using uh, sklearn, scikit-learn, and I'm just loading up uh, the classification report and passing in my Y validation and Y validation predicted. And then from here, I get a per category F1 score. So that lets me look at how well we're doing per category. So uh, acoustic guitar, we're at a 0.8, very nice. Um, a bus, not so great, about a coin flip 50. Uh, really bad on keyboards, uh, also with coughs, super awesome on cowbell. Um, you kind of get the hint here. So we're, you know, depending on the category, we're doing well on some and some not so great. You know, overall, looking at a, at a weighted average, we're about a 0. 0.6. So we're a little better than a, in a coin flip. And, and again, um, there's some more training that we could do to work with this and, and, and improve it. So all in all, a, a, you know, for demo purposes, really helpful and, and, and a, you know, concise way to get started with, with audio data for training. So back to a few slides. So again, model results, 0.6. Um, as we notice, some of the categories are, are higher or lower. Um, what improvements could be made? Well, we could train for more than 50 epochs. Um, that might help. We could go back and get more data. We could get more data in certain categories. We, could, we might be able to, to manually verify more of that data and bring it in. Uh, we could also rework how we're truncating features. Maybe if we went a little bit wider and we took in more windows, we could, we could do more with that. Uh, to improve. And then further, we could also tune the LSTM. We could tune different parameters, maybe add another other layer um, to see if that would help. Uh, we could also do a, um, other models besides LSTMs. Um, we could, there are other types of uh, machine learning models that we could use, other architectures that we could use to, to work with this information with audio files. So, so <clears throat> that's the overview on working with, with audio. Let's change gears for a little bit here and talk about transcribing audio files. So, um, Again, when transcribing, you want to make sure that your audio files are clean. Transcriptions are in separate um, files per speaker. You're using, you know, lossless formats, and you're working with high-quality equipment um, as best you can. And unless you're me, you have phone calls coming here that you you do the best you can with a phone call. So there's different types of systems, APIs, and on-premise. And here, and of all the big players in the industry have have transcription options. So there's AWS, there's Google Cloud, there's Azure, IBM. They all have examples for um, APIs to do to do training. So now I'll click demo. So I have a transcription notebook here. Um, we're in the middle of debates for our current election cycle, but I have everything downloaded from 2016, um, all the debates there, the, the three presidential and one VP debate. And from here, I'm just using the same tools to visualize them and take a look at them. Uh, but further, inside these notebooks here, I have this transcription code. So, um, <clears throat> There's a couple of steps up to doing transcriptions of these files. So first you want to um, upload the file to S3. So in AWS, this is all AWS using AWS Transcribe. I'm using a tool called Boto3 right here, in, right here in Python. I'm uploading my file into an S3 bucket. Um, then once I upload it, I'm just kicking off the transcription job by having a transcription client. I'm uh, telling that client where the audio file is. I'm telling it's an MP3. I'm telling it the output bucket to go work off of and to where, to, where the file should go. And I tell it to go. And, and then I sit back and watch, I can um, pull the status of the job, but when it's done, all I'm gonna do is download the file and look at the transcription results. So I come up here to my audio data, to my data file, and come in the data, <clears throat> into my transcripts, and look at this, uh, this debate's fine, and go into the results. What you're looking for with uh, transcription information is, so you get the full text of the transcription, but you also wanna look at, here it's in the items collection, you really wanna look at the different, um, words and their start and end times because that's that's where a lot of the power shows up is being able to um, search through words based on different time uh, search through the whole transcript and look for certain words within x amount of seconds between things you you know you get a lot more power um, with your modeling and, and work you can do when you're working with that that transcription information so now that we have you know gotten over into a a, um, a transcription we're going to talk about ways we can work with those transcriptions. So we're going to talk about some uh, natural language processing techniques. First thing we're going to look at is keywords. So back to our, let's close this down. 
Back to our notebooks, we're going to look at, look at a couple of different ways to look at keywords. Look at first, we're going to look at is keyword extraction. So from these VP debates, I can simply just do some basic keyword um, summarization, if you will. So I'm using a tool called Jensen. Uh, it's another Python uh, package you can download. I'm doing some very basic pre-processing to remove stop words, and I'm, I'm summarizing and doing uh, keywords. I'm also lemmatizing, so I'm, I'm truncating the word down to just, just the lemmas or the or the stem of the word, if you will. Uh, and then for keywords, I'm just showing the top 20. Um, you know, this debate talked about taxes and Americans and businesses. And then it can also sometimes be an interest in looking at the least 20 keywords as well. So 20 keywords were uh, treaties, private, uh, stamina, et cetera. Um, those words were not um, very much talked about, if you will. So further in keyword spotting, that we can talk about ways that we can search. So that was just ways to do summaries. But if you wanted to do searches of keywords, I have some text, some code here. Again, working with Jensen. I'm loading up all my transcripts. I'm looping over each transcript and loading it up. And then from here, I am processing the transcript into um, clean sentences, if you will. So I'm going to, um, for each sentence, I'm doing get sentences. I'm removing stop words. I'm stemming text, uh, pulling out punctuation and removing white space. And then I want to search for the keyword of taxes. So again, for, for the same um, pre-processing steps you apply to the list of sentences, you also want to apply to your search phrase. So I'm, I'm applying my same four lines here. That stems down to the text. And then from here, I can loop over um, all of my documents and search for that keyword. And you'll see that in a given debates, we found that um, tax 43 times, 32 times, et cetera, somewhere between 20 and, and 45 times um, uh, the word tax was used within the debates. So just a little general way you can you can work with that. So also we're gonna we're gonna run into a couple, we're gonna finish on a couple of um, topics here. Um, first we're gonna look at topic modeling. We're gonna look at ways you can generate topic models and generate these types of really cool views and do some unsupervised um, type of work with your keywords. And then we'll look at sentiment analysis. We're gonna look at polarity of the text documents and talk take a look at those options. So a couple more notebooks to open up and take a look at. We'll go back into um, topic modeling and sentiment analysis. Close this back down. So topic modeling, yeah, I'm using a tool called, so again, uh, Jensen, and I'm, I'm bringing in a tool called um, Spacey. And um, I found a really cool tool I've, I've really enjoyed working with called Pi LDA Viz. And we'll get to all these in a second. So. Again, I'm loading up my debate files. I'm defining my um, helper functions here to process the text, to get text out of the files. Um, and then we're using Spacey for lemonization. We're loading up all of our, <coughs> excuse me, our transcription files, and we're processing them to remove stop words. Then we're doing lemonization across each one, and we're creating a dictionary um, of all the words in our corpus. And then from there, we're then generating a, a bag of words model. So we're taking all of those and, and generating a, a, a bag of words for each document. Then we're passing them into our latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, effectively, that is a type of um, model where you're working with um, text, but you're working with statistical uh, uh, differences about the text. You're, you're looking at different um, uh, distances and calculations uh, trying to group text together into, into known topics. So I'm passing in different um, topics. I'm passing in a topic count of, of 10, uh, random state, uh, number of passes, and um, per word topics to equal true. And then I'm printing them off. And you're seeing different topics and their weights, and, and that's super not helpful. So then further, you can use this tool called PyLDA Viz. And this could be really great to give to your customers to work with their text data. Um, so from here, you can you can just prepare the notebook with uh, LDA Viz. And it worked out better for my screenshot in the slide. But from here, I'm seeing all my different, um, each bubble is a, is a topic. And then when I click on that topic, it shows me different words within that topic. So in this topic number one over here, go, say, Trump, American, um, president, et cetera. And then these bubbles didn't render that well over here. But as I, as I kind of scroll over to them, or I loop through my topics, I can see different words that are in these, these different topics that are available um, to look at. And this, I, I find this tool really helpful, helpful to um, see if my topic models are producing 
um, salient examples that are helpful for my uh, for my project or for, for my research. And then finally, here we're going to wrap up on um, sentiment analysis. So when you're looking at sentiment analysis, you're looking at um, the polarity of the conversation. Um, so we're going to use a tool called uh, the Vader algorithm from NLTK. And um, we're going to load up the sentiment intensity, intensity, excuse me, the sentiment intensity analyzer um, and get that all ready to go. We're going to load up our 2016 debates. We're going to tokenize sentences. And then from here, we're going to loop over every sentence. We're going to calculate a, polar a polarity score. Uh, from here, we're looking for positive, negative, positive, neutral, and negative scores. So we're adding up all the different types. We're dividing it by the sentences. And we have 1,100 sentences in our, you know, for this document, um, you have the um, very much neutral, uh, leaning towards positive, uh, but mo much more neutral conversation than we saw positive overall in the document. So that's the that's the hand rolled way, so to speak, where you're using different tools inside of your notebook to work on this. But if you want to bring in some APIs, I've also had great luck, similar with um, the Transcribe API from AWS. They also have an uh, API called AWS Comprehend, where you can do comprehension of text. And from here, I will note though it has a max of 5K bytes, so you may have to chunk your file effectively. So here, I'm opening up my file, my transcript. I'm starting up a Comprehend um, session. And then I'm telling it to, to detect sentiment in English, and I'm passing in the first 500, uh, excuse me, 5,000 characters. Out comes this result. This tells me overall, I have the sentiment scores for uh, positive, neutral, and negative. And overall, uh, the beginning of this debate was neutral. As you would expect in, in you know, typical debates, you're going, to, you're going to see a lot of uh, handshaking, welcoming, opening statements, things like that. Um, very neutral kind of conversation. But then at the end here, I started going through and detecting sentiment on the last 5,000 um, fi um, words in the debate text. And um, again, I got my scores put out by, uh, by my res results. And overall, it was negative. So this, this one debate that we're looking at here, um, as you would probably expect when things start getting a little bit muzzling towards the end of the debate, um, got more negative and got you know a little little more a uh, little more um, on the negative side of the conversation. So, um, just a couple ways to work with your transcriptions to get different kinds of information out of them. So, in summary, we talked about analog, digital, and audio data characteristics. We talked about audio features. We talked about machine learning with those audio features, transcription, and natural language processing. Thank you all for coming and enjoying this talk virtually. Um, I'll leave the slide up at the end here. You can definitely hit pause and check out my GitHub, Ryan Bales slash audio dash data dash insights. Um, there's my email address, Ryan at Bales of data.com. And my Twitter is just my full name, Ryan Bales. I'm happy to answer any questions um, and chat with all of you. I, I am sorry we couldn't be there together to talk about this at, at, Pi, at Pi Texas. Um, I hope to be there next year and, and uh, talk more about other topics. Um, I hope you're all staying safe. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Please be well. And again, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you all for your time and have a have a great rest of your conference here at Pi Texas.